This podcast is not safe for work and will feature movie spoilers. It will feature scenes described of a graphic nature. It will contain language which most listeners may find offensive. Welcome to the podcast Under the Stairs. Hi everyone and welcome to the podcast Under the Stairs. I'm your host Duncan McLeish, welcome to the show and yes we are continuing our run with the very first volume of the horror head to head. This uh, show, if you're jumping on an episode number three, why not go back to the previous two where I've already explained the rules because I've confused myself even explaining rules which are more simple than what I usually do at summer. But the simple premise is we have four hosts with us, each of them have been assigned a director which was randomly selected and then they were randomly selected to film from their back catalogue. They will come in courtroom style to me, uh, the the judge of the podcast under the stairs, and put forward their case for or against this movie depending on their views. Um, They will also score the movie uh, based over five criteria, that criteria being story, Acting, effects, soundtrack and kills. The scoring is 1 through 10, so not your traditional podcast under the stairs scoring. Um, At the end of this one, you will have a combined total score from that reviewer out of 50 as to what they made of the film. Sounds nice and easy, doesn't it? Well, it kind of isn't, because when they finish their review and give their scores, we're going to open up to the remaining hosts to do a little bit of cross-examination, if you will. If they agree with the movie, it's just a lot of back-slapping and well done, you did great, and then we hear their scores. But maybe they take umbrage, maybe they pick apart some of the things that have been said. Maybe they come at it from a different angle. We will find out as we work around. Like I said, four hosts, four movies. On this episode, we will be looking at only three directors because one director had both his picks for this season drop into the same episode, that being Lucio Fulci. So before we introduce you to our hosts and find out what shows they're representing, I can tell you that on this episode you'll be hearing reviews of Lucio Fulci's House by the Cemetery and City of the Living Dead. You will be hearing a little review of Alexander Aja's High Tension aka Hot Tension aka Switchblade Romance and then last but not least, uh, Kurushi Kurosawa's The Geritype, um, which will be uh, the, the the movie which no one knew about until we basically decided to do this show. When I say no one, I mean as in it is technically a horror movie, but at the same time, it's not the ones that people are talking about, which is the benefit of doing this show. Now, introducing the hosts on this episode, uh, I'm going to be going in order of when they will be appearing representing their movie. So without further ado, let me get to the first host joining us is Mike Merriman. How you doing, Mike? Hey, Duncan. It's great to be back. Mike, what show are you representing? I'm representing our f- weekly Fresh Cuts and No More Room in Hell today. Excellent, Mike. Pleasure to have you back. Uh, let's keep the good times going. Bo Ransdell, are you there? I am, representing Team USA. <laughs> uh, we're bringing home the gold, okay. <laughs> the horror gold coming home. <laughs> You do have a podcast, though. I didn't just pick you because you're a keen sportsman. I, I do. I do. That's what lets me stay in the amateur status uh, and compete <laughs> olympically. Um, I have uh, <laughs> a, a, a podcast called uh, The Dark Parade, uh, which has a number of kind of sub shows beneath that heading. Uh, currently, our, our, our most important project, and, and they may be the most important project <laughs> before mankind is going through and ranking every single horror movie that's ever been made uh in order so uh you know the work continues duncan <laughs> it seems like a thankless job Bo. um but i'm glad that you you are taking up the mantle there no one else has i think myself thank you Bo. <laughs> you're welcome uh also joining us who will be the third reviewer um dave z how you doing dave great uh happy to be here it's it's awesome to be here with a bunch of 
old friends, some that I haven't recorded with in a long time. So it's um, this is really cool. Uh, I guess I'm representing uh, Exploding Heads Horror mm-hmm. Movie Podcast, uh, Jay the Dead's new horror movies, uh, Watsy Party Horror Show, if that ever comes around again. And um, yeah, things are good. Things are, and I'm just happy to be here. So thank you. It's always a pleasure having you here, buddy. And then closing out the show um, on the the reviews for the final movie we'll be doing on this one is our good buddy Tyler Tadeo. How are you doing, Tyler? What's up? Great to be back in the house. It's awesome to have you here. What show are you representing? I am representing the 22 Shots of Moods and Horror in the Sin Bin podcast. Yeah, now explain the sin bin again because you've explained it to me, GP's explained it to me, and not that I have forgotten what it is, I totally remember what it is, but to the listeners out there, I love the concept, so uh, give us a bit of context. So, it's actually a video cast, you can still also listen to it on our podcast feed, too, it's not only available in video, and basically what it is, it is a monthly review show for Vinegar Syndrome. So we started it in January and covered the er, the last month's releases, which would have been November of 2023. And then every year, we, every month we've gone uh, another month forward. So February we did January's releases, and we just do that straight away. Um, and basically the format is just we all, there's four of us. Sometimes a fifth person will come on to interview uh, <laughs> to interview for uh, <laughs> to cover that line of vinegar syndrome. But, uh, or not, review. <laughs> and we all select our movie, whether it's from a sub label from Vinegar Syndrome or a partner label, uh, and we all do our own review on it. And then we have a main review that we usually try to stick um, straight up uh, with Vinegar Syndrome and try to like kind of pick something that's like the like the most like the biggest release of uh, of, of the month or the most interesting one to like mass mass people. Usually a horror movie if we can, but yeah, it's a lot of fun. Uh, we've we're seven episodes in now and. It's a monthly podcast, easy to catch up on, and it's a lot of fun. Check it out. Perfect, perfect. Thank you very much, Tyler. So, I've told you what the format is of the show. Um, I'm very much looking forward to this because we do have um, we do have some real heavy hitters in the horror genre um, in the director's chair, but that doesn't always equate to the best movies. So, without any further ado, we're going to turn our attention to the first of four movie reviews coming at you. This is the first of two back-to-back Lucio Fulci movies. Um, the first one is going to be helmed by one Mr. Mike Merriman, but before we get to that, let's give you some deets on the movie. It says, How by the Cemetery from 1981. It's directed, of course, by the master of gore, Lucio Fulci, and uh, based on the... Ilsa Briganti story, uh, which was adapted for screenplay by Dardano Sacchi and <laughs> Giorgioro. Oh, there's a lot of foreign names here, and Lucio Fulci. Um, I tell you, yeah, those stuff. guys. Thank you. <laughs> um, I feel really guilty because like their names are attached to like all the movies I love, and I think this is God's cruel joke, uh, making me love a genre predominantly in places where names are just impossible for me to pronounce. Um, Where you can only communicate in clicks and buzzes. (laughs) Shut the fuck up. Uh, (laughs) uh, Sergio (laughs) Salvati is the DP on this one, who, to be honest, um, from the point of making The Psychic in the late 70s with Fulci, pretty much stuck on with him through a run of uh, what would now be classed as great horror movies that's zombie flesh years black cat the beyond he also did 1986 crawl space which is a ton of fun um and if you just want to see klaus kinski go mental um like he does in every single movie that's the one to do it on um out of the gates of hell trilogy this is the movie that doesn't have um the fabio frizzy sim track actually this one was done by walter rizzati uh, the movie itself stars katrona mccall uh, paolo macco ania peroni uh, giovanni frizzi Sylvia Colatina, uh, Dagmar Lassander, and Giovanni De Nassa. Um, the synopsis for this one is listed on IMDb. A New England home is terrorised by a series of murders, unbeknownst to the guests that the gruesome secret is hiding in the basement. Spoiler alert, come on guys. Um, the trivia here. Uh, this is the third part of Lucio Fulci's Gates of Hell trilogy. The other two films, of course, include Sight of the Living Dead, Wait for Bo's Review, and The Beyond, which came out in 1981. Um, this also is one of the early VHS issues that happened with some titles in America. The, the story behind this one is that um, 
on certain early VHS issues, the reels of film were out of order, and as a result, the already erratic story appeared to much viewers as much more confusing than it already is. Which I don't know if that benefits or or hinders a movie like this, if I'm being honest. So that's that that's the deets, that's the background, that's the context. All we need is a review for or again. So at this time, the podcast under the stairs would like to call to the docket, Mike Miniman. Please present your case for or against House by the Cemetery. All right. So this is going to be interesting because much like the last episode I did, we have two movies from the same director. Mm -hmm. And because Fulci has such a distinguished style, there's probably going to be a lot of crossover, at least in my comments about the movies. Uh, Fulci, like you said, he he employs... I, I feel like he... A lot of his movies, he makes what I like to call nightmares <laughs> because mm -hmm. there's so much conflicting logic and things you kind of have to go with. Like a lot of people classify him as making zombie movies, but you can't really go into most of those expecting like your standard zombie movies because there's usually some type of purpose behind them, some type of curse or like the gates of hell which we'll be talking about there's something that triggers the zombies unlike a you know a standard romero movie where they're just there because it because it happened uh, maybe fulci zombie is like the most i guess you could say like uh romero like mm. version of a movie he's done but once he kind of gets further down his direction we get movies like the gates of hell trilogy where something's triggering it something's set in motion to cause this uh, this movie, uh, w one word I can use is Bob because there's a whole lot of Bob in this movie. <laughs> so, <laughs> I, I had actually forgotten how prominent Bob is in this because I hadn't seen it in a while. Uh, Bob emotes a lot in this movie. He <laughs> yelps a lot. He screams for help. He cries a lot. Um, and and honestly, the the uh, the comment you made about how the kind of dream logic or nightmare logic. That is kind of a, um, a bonus for some and a detraction for others when mm -hmm. it comes to Fulci. I think he he can be dividing like that, which I didn't really know when I was younger because when I first started discovering Fulci, you know, it was in the VHS store and it was mostly between like your small bubble of friends pre-internet era where, holy shit, this is just a cool guy doing graphic hardcore uh, zombie movies but like as your network of people kind of opened up and you realize that, well with all the kind of weirdness in his movies the absurdity the bizarre it's not a positive for everyone some people like more straightforward narratives or just uh logic in their mm -hmm. movies and fulci's don't always or fulci movies don't always necessarily follow the logic people are used to i personally am a fan because i just appreciate different styles um because we're also covering city of the living dead i'll say like i probably favor that one over this one spoiler for for the next review but i still enjoy this one uh like once we get into our my actual ratings that'll probably reflect that i definitely feel like it's an above average movie that i get enjoyment out of but within the context of the trilogy it's probably my third out mm -hmm. of the trilogy but overall it's it's enjoyable you get the gore i still like the score even though it, it's done by a different uh individual or team uh and you know uh, i still think you fulci hits the points that that you expect in a fulci movie so overall yeah i still find it, it, it an enjoyable movie thank you very much mike let's see if those scores reflect out and uh, now like i mentioned in the intro we're doing five categories story acting effects soundtrack and kills and um, the scores are one through ten ten being the maximum you can give any one element um so let's talk about story story what did you give story i came in with a seven you gave it a seven out of ten acting i also gave it a seven Give it seven. Um, it's it's, it's Bobby Bob. You know he he's putting in the work. <laughs> I love there's that there's that famous clip. I think it was doing the rims. It might be in front of the Arrow Blu-ray, where the actor is basically saying he's stressing. That's not my voice. You know, like please, <laughs> please stop coming up to me at conventions and asking Mommy, me. Mommy, <laughs> help me. Hundred percent not my voice. It was overdubbed. It's not me. Um, <laughs> let's talk effects. What are you giving this one? I kicked that one up to to an eight. I, I think the effects are pretty good in this one, yeah. Um, soundtrack, you did say you enjoyed it. 
Yes, uh, also an eight. Still liked it. Maybe it it probably wasn't as prominent to me as uh, City of the Living Dead and Beyond, but I still did enjoy it. Awesome. And then kills, lastly. Kills, I gave a seven because I think they're good. I just don't think, like, when I when I put them in context, I wouldn't say they're as memorable or maybe over the top as, like, the, the other ones in the trilogy. Cool. Which means, Mike, out of the maximum of 50 points, you gave House by the Cemetery 37. Um, thank you very much. Now, I don't run away because we're going to run sh around some of the other hosts here and get them to chip in with their views and uh, pick up anything that they either agree with or disagree with. And going in order of the reviewers after your review, we're going to turn our attention to the other Filchy guy here, um, Bo. Bo, um, coming in on this one, anything that you agree with, disagree with, you want to bring up, highlight? Well, as the Filchy guy, Duncan. <laughs> Um, I, <laughs> which you've I, never been called ever, but I love I love that we're now making you the de facto Fulci guy. Uh, but I kind of am, and you I are. think over time I become more of a Fulci guy. Mm. Uh, at the risk of of <laughs> sounding uh flip about it, but <laughs> Fulci is kind of a vibe. Yeah, you know, like like when you're watching a Fulci movie, even uh, uh, uh even bad Fulci has some fun shit in it. Mm -hmm. And, and I don't think that House by the Cemetery is bad Fulci. I don't think it's peak Fulci by a mile. Yeah. Um, like you, Mike's already pointed this out, but the Fabrizi score is missing. And that's just, it, look, the man is a genius. Mm -hmm. Every uh, Fabrizi score for a Fulci movie is on my like Spotify playlist. I love it all. Yeah. Um, and, uh, you know, calling a kid Bob, first of all, is just a terrible thing to do to a child. <laughs> um, and the fact that you just hear Bob over and over again in this movie becomes a little bit maddening. I also think uh, that's what he thinks everyone in America is called, because there's right. a character called Bob in Say of the Living Dead as well. <laughs> right, it, like there's Bobs and Teds and, you know, it's very... <laughs> It's that type, like that that period, that late seventies, early eighties kind of Americana. Because it's true, everybody was named Bob or Ted. Yeah, uh, there's that movie, Bob and Ted and Carol and Alice, or whatever. Like that's because that those were the names. We yeah, had. Bob and Ted's Excellent Adventure. I remember it, Bob. Um, exactly. Uh, that, no, that's when we got a bill. That was when we got three names. It was a big, it was a big day. Different decade. Uh, <laughs> but I, I do like house by the cemetery for a lot of reasons it i like the story of this even though i don't think the story is particularly well told mm. but this idea of like oh there's the this manner where these experiments were being conducted and that has you know there are monsters but kind of ghosts but also kind of monsters and it, it's all a little bit silly and vague as like all fulci stuff is a little bit silly and vague uh but i i enjoy it um the knife through the back of the head pretty fucking good like i feel like the the best effects of the movie are up front like the guy when you see him with no skull and you see the brain exposed and stuff uh like that's really cool the knife through the back of the head is good the rest of it feels a little more of that like let's just throw some ground up cornflakes at somebody's face <laughs> that that fulci vibe and there's a little bit of, of that in uh city of the living dead we'll get to but um, I think it's good. I think I think House by the Cemetery is a perfectly cromulent Fulci film, uh, yeah. but I don't think it rises above that because there are so many little things about it that are just like, eh, you know, we're like all the spinning the wheels with the real estate shit. Mm. Some of that is interesting. Like the curse stuff is interesting. Anything else, like get rid of it. Like forget about <laughs> like who bought it when and from who and all that stuff. Like that's fucking nonsense. Um, but at, at any rate, I, I do like it. I think House by the Cemetery is a, a, a fun horror film. Yeah, you're not far off, Mike, then. But are your scores far off, Mike, Bo? Let's find but, out. <laughs> can I, can I pre preview this just slightly? Yeah. In that, like, oh, as I was listening to him to give the scores, I was like, oh, yeah, I'm like one less on everything. Yeah, you, you're not, you're really not that far away. Um, yeah, Story, what did you give it? I gave this movie uh, a seven because it's it, it's silly, but I do like it. Yeah, so that's spot on with what Mike gave. Um, acting? A six. Like, yeah. <laughs> you know, it's slightly above average because I do like how hysterical Bob gets. <laughs> There's one below what Mike gave. Uh, effects? 
Uh, also a seven because, uh, you know, again, it's all front loaded by the end of the movie. It's like, hey, where's the Fulci that I need? Why is nobody puking up an intestine? <laughs> one below. Uh, Sam Track. Yep. No Fabrizi. Also a seven. Yep. That's one below. And then kills. Ah, this one's like a six. Again, all front loaded. And by the end of it, all the kills are like, hey, I'm going to scare somebody and drag them off screen to mess with their face or whatever. I don't know. You can keep it. I need I need more out of my kills than a Fulci film. <laughs> which means out of a maximum of 50, you gave the movie 33, which is four below Mike. Uh, thank you very much for your service, Bo Ransdell. Let's move to Dave Z. Anything you want to lean in on, pick up on, anything that's not been mentioned, anything you disagree with? Uh, you know, no, I, I, I pretty much, I feel like I line up with, with Mike for the most part, where mm. I don't, I, I think Bo dislikes it a little bit more, but I, I seem to feel the way uh, everyone so far has felt, that that, it, that it's a good Fulci movie, it's just not on the par with, it's not on par with the other ones in, in the trilogy, for sure. And, and, you know, there's two movies tonight where we're going to be talking about real estate nonsense, which really bogs <laughs> down the plot, <laughs> It's, right? it's, it's maybe like an, it's maybe the most true to life thing ever though like real estate is boring and it takes ages so like, right. why, why, why put it in a movie <laughs> yes sir it does not belong in a movie real estate no just unless you're talking about moving houses over gravestones like poltergeist or yes. something like yeah. that yeah. <laughs> it's real estate is like prestige television stuff where you can do it over 10 episodes <laughs> <laughs> Right. But, you know, I dig it. I dig Fulci stuff for this time. I just kind of, there's just not enough. I mm. guess that's a good way to describe this when you're comparing it to, and I can't help but compare it directly to the Beyond and City of the Living Dead. Yeah. You just can't help it. You know, it's lumped in there. It's the trilogy. And it's, there's just not enough here. It's almost like he was saving everything else for because this one came out first, right? I believe. No, no, this one's the this one's the third one. So this is this comes out the same year as the Beyond, and I kind of think this is. Oh, that's right. Yeah, I think this Sitting is eighty. Right? Yeah, I I think this is like I think you had the I think he's he's literally pulled every trick out of the bag in the other two movies. That this is mm -hmm. kind of what's left over. Um, so I agree. Just, yeah, I I think that's the, the it's insane to think that he got all three of these movies in two years. Um, which is just, it no. is crazy, yeah, <laughs> and it's good. And you know, everything about Bob is what it is. The, the funny thing is, nobody talks about the girl, yeah. she's not prominent as much, and her voice isn't as annoying, but it is kind of weird. And I always laugh at the one line when she goes, You shouldn't have come, Bob. <laughs> <laughs> it's done so calm. I don't know, it's just that stuff is funny, but that's just what they did at the time. And mm -hmm. I've heard that Bob voice in other movies oh yeah and of course yeah right italian of course because that's that's how they make their films and yeah and i've seen bob in other movies and his voice wasn't like that so we already know that's not how it is but you know we gotta mention bob each time i think it's just it, it's kind of what the, the the movie is known for honestly it's, it's kind of went it's kind of went like towards like there is there is a, a movement for and against bob on the internet um and it's uh, <laughs> it's, it's kind of amazing to see the polarization i was actually thinking about when we we're mentioning there like vilci did um city of the living dead the black cat was the same year as city of the living dead and then you also have the Beyond and House by the Cemetery. So four horror movies in two years. Uh, which wow. Is, which I kind of... <laughs> and that's the, what, the year after uh, Zombie Flesh Years. So technically you've got to lump that in as well. Three-year period, five horror movies. Absolutely wow. insane. <laughs> and well-made movies. I mean, yeah. say what you will, but Fulci does have a flair. He has a look of his, of his films. He's not lazy. I mean, maybe for the time you could say there might have been a few questionable choices for some of the, the practical effects, uh -huh. I suppose. And that, that is what it is, but he's not lazy. So he's putting out four movies that are, there's actual work going into it. Isn't like, you know, filming four POV movies in, yep. in two years or something like that. This is, it tries to be arty. It looks good. As far as like artistic merit though, there is one thing about this movie where I just, and it's not the only full team movie that's like this for me, but the nightmare logic it's just they're asking too much of the viewer mm. to to fill things in, and I think there comes a point where you can't say it's lazy. I know a lot of people 
kind of defend the nightmare logic. But for me, I don't know. It doesn't, sometimes it can work. Like if it's a movie where the, the style is the substance, uh, where they're just doing things like they had throughout, I could see that working. But when you're presenting yourself in a normal type narrative, but then just throwing in nightmare logic just because it, it, it moves the plot along, it, it doesn't vibe with me all the time. I'm not knocking it. I just, you know, in this case, I don't think it works to its advantage. That's all. Very nice. Um, right, let's talk your scores then. Um, what did you give the movie on story? I gave it a six. I could follow along for the most part, but the Nightmare Logic stuff doesn't, it weighs it down a bit. So yeah. six. That's one below Bo and Mike. Uh, what did you give the acting? Uh, seven, which is tough because you're yeah. really just talking about, you know, it's it's voice acting uh, <laughs> for a lot of it. and But for the most part, people seem to be doing knowing what they're doing, so. That's uh, spot on with what Bo, um, sorry, with what Mike gave it, one above what Bo gave it. Um, effects? Effects is also a seven. Most everything works for the most part. Yep, it's one below Mike, but the same as Bo. Uh, what did you give the sim track? I gave it a six and a half. Mm -hmm. I enjoy it. It's obviously not anything like a, like a frizzy. And um, I don't know why that decision was made in this one, but whatever. It's just, but it definitely sticks out. And there's just... It's a decent soundtrack. There just doesn't seem to be enough of it. It doesn't seem like it's implemented uh, like throughout the film, like in like in the other ones from the trilogy. Right. Um, yeah, I, I mean, it's a weird one. I, I'm assuming it was just availability, um, but I, I've, I've never I've never researched it. Um, Kills, what did you give it? Gave it a seven and a half. Mm -hmm. I would like to go higher because there are a few great kills in this movie, but... The thing at the end just kind of puzzles me when dra dragging the head down the uh, down the, the stairs. And I guess it's cool to hear the thump, thump, thump. And then you just get down there and there's like a pool of blood by the head. And I'm just like, after all the, after the couple real kick-ass kills that we've mm -hmm. seen, that just seems like a, like a lazy decision. Right. Well, let's, uh, let's total them up for you, uh, Dave. Out of a maximum of 50, you gave this movie 34, which is one higher than Bo and three below what Mike gave it. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, last but not least, um, Tyler, is there anything that has, you've got the fourth position on this, so you are literally <laughs> going to be like cleaning up on every single review here. Um, but is there anything that hasn't been mentioned, anything you want to emphasize before we get to your scores? So overall, I think I agree. Like I, I agree with all the sediments that, um, that have been brought forward. Mm -hmm. Specifically, where I think the problem with this movie is, especially like when you look in the context of the trilogy, is this movie's tries is more narratively driven than the mm -hmm. other ones, and the narrative's like not that good. And the better these movies that like were full, she just like putting like stuff on screen that doesn't matter, and he's not concerned about the plot, like flourish more. Obviously, the less plot you have, so like this is like kind of trying to tell a story at the same time. So you get like kind of like little scenes but that's why like i think it feels like really awkward and that's like the biggest mix about the movie that where i think it goes wrong but you know it's still a fulci movie so it's still doing like he's still doing like fulci things and like things you can like point at this like that other movies like don't do and it's sitting like you know between two other beloved movies so it, it, it's it's a pretty it's it's a movie that like i don't that probably has some of its status because of just like its proximity to these movies, but it's still like it's still a good movie that should be like horror canon. Awesome, awesome. Right, uh, let's talk about your scores then and see how far or spot on you are from the mark what everyone else has got. Um, what did you give the story? I gave the story a six. Right, so that's the same as Dave and one below both Mike and Bo, so pretty much spot on. Uh, acting. Acting, I gave a six, despite Bob being probably the most annoying character <laughs> like ever in existence. There, it's not as important in a movie like this. And then there's like uh, they do. I did feel like a lot of like the kill scenes, like the acting was like really good and like really sold it. So I, I definitely want to like give it a feather in its cap for that. <laughs> you said this is six, and that's the same as what Bo gave it, and one below what Dave and Mike gave it. Uh, FX, what did you give it? Effects, I gave it an 8. So that's the same as Mike and one above both Bo and Dave. Um, soundtrack? 
Soundtrack. I, I like the soundtrack. I think it's used pretty decently. Uh, I'll give it, I give that a seven. Cool. That's the same as Bo. Uh, 0.5 above Dave and one below Mike. And then lastly, kills. I gave the kills a seven. I think like the effects of just like guts and stuff like the ground, the cinematography like is a little bit better than the kills itself. And like I said, like it kind of has the weak ending uh, as far as like the kill scale goes. So a little bit lower on that. Yeah, if I had to do an average of all your scores here, uh, seven would be the average. So you're a 0.5 below what Dave gave it, one above what Bo gave it, and the same as what Mike gave it. Which means that of a maximum of 50 points, you gave this movie 34, uh, which is the same as what Dave gave it, uh, one above what Bo gave it, and three below what Mike gave it. Which means um, ordering them from highest to lowest score, Mike gave it with the maximum 37. Um, then we go to a a kind of joint second place of Dave Z and Tyler, 34, and then Bo uh, with 33. So you're all pretty much on point with this one. Well done, guys. I kind of feel like this team here is going to be a high level of synchronicity. Or am I just wishful thinking? We will find it as we move along. Thank you very much, Mike. You can step down from the docket and we will turn our attention to our next Filchie movie. Let's just keep going with Filchie. The next one is, of course, City of the Living Dead, the first instalment of the Gates of Hell trilogy. Uh, Bo will be representing this movie, but let me give you some deets before we get to that. Um, we have uh, the year of release, 1980. Um, once again, directed by Fulci. Fulci and Dardano Siracci are behind the story and the screenplay, with inspiration being taken from H.P. Lovecraft and Clark Ashton Smith. Uh, the DP on this one is, once again, Sergio Savati, who worked on all those movies I mentioned before. This time, the score being done by Fabio Frizzi, who once again worked on a ton of stuff with Filchi, but other stuff throughout the 80s. So you've got things like The Psychic, Zombie Flesh Eaters, Contraband, The Beyond, Manhattan Baby, and The Scorpion with Two Tails. Uh, this movie stars Christopher George, by God does it ever, Catrona McCall, Carlo De Meo, uh, Antoleria Interleggi, uh, Giovanni Lombardo Radis, Daniela Doria and Fabrizio Jovin. Um, the synopsis for this one is a reporter and a psychic race to the gates of hell after the suicide of a clergyman caused them to open, allowing the dead to rise from their graves. A little bit of trivia here for you guys here. Uh, director Lucio Fulci always carried around a bag with his trademark pipe and tobacco. One day on set, he reached into the bag and found a handful of maggots which had been used earlier to film a scene in which maggots blow through a window. The perpetrator of this prank is rumoured to be one Mr Christopher George, the film's lead actor who did not get along well with Filchie. Uh, another bit of fact for you here, there are a ton of explanations for how the end took its shape. Neither Filchie nor Sachi were ever any help in straight out. Some say the editor spilled coffee on the footage of the original ending, forcing the crew to improvise. Some say the original footage was meant to be a happy ending, but Filchie changed his mind after shooting completed, and this was the best that they could do. The last bit, and the one that did make me dry heave and slightly vom uh, when I read this one, this was filmed, this movie was filmed in a hot, hazy, muggy, 108 degrees Fahrenheit, or if you're in the UK, 42 degrees Celsius, uh, which I'm sure I've talked about this before, is about 10, de well, about 8 degrees Celsius hotter than Scotland has ever been. So the idea of that and maggots and rubber and latex, bleh, so that's all I'm going to say about that. Um, going away from something unpleasant, let's turn ourselves and our attention to something very pleasant, and that is the wonderful Mr. Bo Ransdell. Uh, Bo, if you would like to make your way to the docket, please, uh, and present your case, either for or against, City of the Living Dead. Uh, thank you. And first, I would like to ask, what dark web bullshit are you looking up that you found pro-Bob discourse on the <laughs> internet? It, that we, does not seem right. We 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 have a mutual friend who um, you've recorded with many 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 times. Who I think may have a may be the the, the dark web behind the pro Bob movement. Uh, one Richard Glenn Smith will not I, get a bad word said about Bob, and he has a legion look, of people that listen to his voice, and they all agree, Bo. They all agree. Yeah. As soon as you said it was a mutual friend, I knew who you meant. <laughs> Part of that, it. Like, the pro-bob like, like, movement exists, Bo. It exists, and it's nasty. Right. 
he's also very pro like Rob Zombies 31. So let's <laughs> <laughs> well, let's not uh, attach too much weight to this um, <laughs> debate we will have till one of us is dead um, anyway so a house by the cemetery this is what we're talking about when we're talking about Fulci this is the shit mm. this is the stuff that you want put in your arm and injected <laughs> directly into you um, it is gory as all get out uh, definitely has a vibe. And I think that because you're bouncing between a couple of storylines, you get a little more variation in setting as you're kind of bopping around uh, the city of New Orleans. New Orleans. New Orleans. Orleans. And uh, yeah, and so you've got great stuff happening. Like you've got the, uh, the, the ghostly uh, priest popping in and out of scenes, making people vomit up their guts. And honestly, when I think of Fulci, this is what I think of. I think of the vomiting of the intestines. That is <laughs> that is Fulci to me. Because it is outrageous and it's gory and it's technicolor as hell. And and it's just audacious. Yeah, prolonged uh, as well. That camera just sits there for a while. <laughs> I oh I love it so much. And and uh, like now that we have the benefit of HD, you can see those like tiny tubes that run into people's <laughs> eyes to make them cry blood and whatnot but i don't care i love it i love the tiny tubes i like this is a thing that now you would do all digitally or something and there is something so beautiful about the effects work uh in in house by the cemetery or not house by the Cemetery. yeah uh city of the living dead sorry um it, it, there's just something gratuitous and 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 technical about it like the the craftsmanship is really good um you know all the face molds that they have to do to shove intestines through and all that mm -hmm. stuff like all that stuff looks pretty good and and i like the story more in this one because we're not getting bogged down in real estate instead we're dealing with a curse and if you don't lift it by this particular time then you know the the gates of hell open up and uh, it's all gonna be a big mess uh and i, I like all of that stuff works for me we've got great music um, it's just, it, it's one of the best Fulci stuff. Like this and the beyond mm. are kind of my two favorites, uh, because there's a little bit of Lovecraft peppered into this, you know, that sort of town curse that's going to taint everything. Um, so it's, it feels a little literary, even though it's real grindhouse too. Uh, I just love it. I, the city of the living dead is, is terrific. I, I love this movie. Awesome, awesome. Well, let's uh, let's get into uh, the grades. I'm expecting something relatively high here, Bo. Um, what did you give the story? Uh, it's an eight. Uh, not perfect, but it's fun. Love it. Um, acting. Uh, this is a little bit of a stumbling, uh, stumbling <laughs> point. Uh, about a seven. You know, uh, look, Christopher George. I love him to death, but there are moments you can tell that he's just like you know, stubbing out a smoke and finishing a drink before he has to do the take of like, what do I got to do? Just stand there and you're going to throw shit on me. All right. Um, I, I, but I, I kind of like it, but it's not great for the, you know, film. <laughs> I get what you're saying. Um, he's also one year away from making pieces, which is a superior acting performance. Um, <laughs> so, let's talk effects. What did you give the effects? Uh, the effects is a, a, a solid eight here. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. I mean, again, you can see the microtubes and stuff. It's not flawless, but it's really good. Um, soundtrack? Uh, another eight. Oof, we're just like firing at these high scores here. I um, is there any room to go above? Let's find out. Kills. Oh, man. This is a 10. Like I said, this is when I think of like horror movie deaths. Uh, City of the Living Dead has some of the gnarliest. Like, people's brains are coming out. The drill and... scene alone. <laughs> the drill scene. That drill scene is fucking technically amazing. Yeah. It's really good. Like, the kills in this movie are so damn good. And, like, this is a movie you could recommend on kills alone. Mm. But it has that X factor, that kind of vibe, that atmosphere that Fulci carries with it. So that's that's why I love it so much. It's It's got everything I like about a Fulci movie. Um, yeah, I mean, is the end inexplicable? Sure it is. But <laughs> by that point, you know, you got what you, you, you got your money's worth and you thank Lucio Fulci for putting that on the screen. <laughs> 
<laughs> out of a maximum 50 points, you gave this movie 41. Mm-hmm. I like it, Bo. I like it. Uh, don't go anywhere, though, because we have to have to swing this round and see how close you are to the views of our other guest hosts. Um, we're going to go in order, so we're starting with Mike first. Uh, Mike, anything that hasn't been said, anything that you want to kind of lean in on uh, before we get to your scores? Uh, I mean, I'll just add to what I kind of said last time when it comes to Fulci he has like an otherworldly effect i i believe bo kind of mentioned lovecraft or lovecraftian uh elements and i think that's very spot on description of fulci uh there's a lot of elements that don't feel grounded in like the real world or how like like i said like a like a romero zombie film even though it's zombies that don't actually exist it, it still feels grounded in like the rules of the world where Fulci, uh, it's not just zombies. It's a zombie that teleports out of a noose to your car and then disappears after it's done what it needs to do. It's a zombie or a demon zombie staring at you and guts are being vomited as a result. And I also agree that that's uh, when I think of Fulci, the first two things that come to mind are the vomiting guts or from zombie, the, I think it's like the Spanish conquistador main zombie that shows up on every logo you've ever seen for that movie. Those are like the two things that come to my mind when I think, or for first two things automatically when I hear the name Fulci, but yeah, this one, I, I think if you want, like if you want to give someone a good idea of like what you're in for with, with Fulci, show them this movie and they're either going to say, I want more or I never want to talk to you again. So this is a good uh, measuring stick for if someone's going to enjoy Fulci going forward or not. Very nice. Let's uh, run down your scores, uh, see how far they are away from Bo. Uh, what did you give the story? I gave the story an eight. That's yeah, a, uh, I was going to say, uh, yeah, I was going to say, oh yeah, what I forgot to say is with Fulci story, sometimes it's, it's because he's fitting so many elements into mostly like 90 minute movies, yes. right? It, <laughs> they're never, you, you look at how he writes a story or crafts a story. And it feels like with all the ideas that are going into it, it's like this with the right budget, it could be like a two hour epic mm -hmm. movie, but uh, he has 90 minutes and a smaller budget and he's not going to cut out any of his uh, ideas. So yeah, there you go. But I, I thought it came together pretty well. This one. Acting, what did you give it? Uh, I gave it a seven. Yep, that's the same as Bo as well. Uh, effects? Uh, I actually went way high on this one, a nine. Um, lots of signature good good stuff. I And, you know, I'm not going to hold a movie made way back then against uh, uh, the fact that we have 4K now, <laughs> which they could have never envisioned. So I'm not. I, I'm cool. Uh, nine for effects. Right, that's one above Bo. Uh, soundtrack? Uh, eight, one of his signature uh, freezy soundtracks to me. It, it's it's on the on the regular horror playlist. Yep, that's the same as what Bull gave it. And lastly, kills. I gave the kills eight. I kind of feel like now I'm underscoring like the kills <laughs> now that I think about it because like not just the guts vomiting, but the brain squishes mm. are pretty signature and the drill kill. Like I don't know why. Uh, I guess I got to stick with it. That's I, that's what I put on the sheet, an eight, but uh, maybe I uh, underplayed it. <laughs> so eight. Yeah, um, that means uh, that out of a total of 50, you gave this 40. So, I mean, that's one below what Bo gave it. So thank you very much. Uh, let's turn it around to Dave Z. Anything that has been mentioned, hasn't been mentioned, or anything that you want to lean in on before we get your scores? Nothing in particular. I, this is uh, this is my favorite of the of the trilogy. Mm. This is the, um, when you think of Fulci, you pretty much get all Fulci isms yep. uh, throughout this whole movie. It's 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 a great movie. In a way, I think it's a little bit slept on. In um, I think among, the Beyond gets a lot of oxygen. Yes. Um, yeah. Yeah, I agree with that. That that's what I feel. I feel the Beyond gets a lot. Uh, another great movie but is this significantly better than this i mean i don't know this it used to be my favorite this one is now so but it, it it's you know you can compare them both i think the weirdest thing is that this is the most <laughs> un halloween october 31st horror movie you've ever gonna see. <laughs> 
<laughs> it's just like mentioned casually. Oh, and when's All Saints Day? Midnight. Okay. In other words, <laughs> this is fucking Halloween. We're not doing anything Halloween in this movie. It's just so matter of fact that it's October 31st. It's so easily distinguishable as being made by an Italian. Because um, like, I, I don't know how they, they obviously don't celebrate this. But it's set in America. So you have to kind of put the effort in. Like if you watch a movie like Absurd, for example, which is, I think it's, like was filmed about the same time. Absurd has all those references in there where they need to be um, for it being set in America. In the case of this one, Phil, she's like, yeah, it's the background. No, nah, no, nah, I don't need to worry about anything else. They'll get it. <laughs> I mean, put a jack-o'-lantern somewhere. <laughs> Shit. <laughs> But yeah, I love the movie. So there's really nothing else I can add there. It's it's great. Let's talk your score, Sam. What did you give this story? I gave it a seven. And uh, for Fulci, that, that's pretty high. Yep, that's only one below what Mike and Dave gave it. Uh, what about acting? The acting, I give a seven. I just can't go higher because of, like I said earlier, with the dubbing. It's hard to really, you know, it's hard to weigh acting when everything is... <laughs> All the, you know, everything's overdubbed after, but you know, it, I don't see any weaknesses really, so I think a seven's fair. Yep, that's straight across the board with what the scores we've had thus far. Effects, what are you giving this one? Uh, nine. I, I don't think, uh, I think it's it's all pretty solid set pieces, uh, special effects, everything. Um, it's all pretty on point, and as far as you know, it's really tough to find a movie from this time period mm. using practicals where you may not be able to figure out how the magic is made. It's just, you know, yeah, it's I mean, still so much better than thing, TG. If you watch The Thing, and The Thing is regarded of this time period, in or around this time, is regarded as one of the best, like, practical effect horror movies ever made. And I can yeah. see the strings in 4K, so <laughs> like, you know, I can see right. what's been filmed around in a buggy. Um, so, yeah, it's, it's, it's very difficult. Um, you've given us a nine though, and that is in line with Mike and one above what Bo gave it. Um, where are you on the soundtrack? Soundtrack is also a nine. Uh, I think it's fantastic. It's, it's, it's probably my favorite favorite one from uh, Fabio Frizi. So amazing! That is one above what both Mike and Bo gave it. And then lastly, kills nine. They're, they are great. The only reason it's not a ten is because of the overuse. Of the, the brain squeezes. We get it three <laughs> times. For Fulci, doing all these other cool kills, I I think they could have, you know, at least sacrificed one of those brain squeezes and, and just shown something else, you know. But great stuff, man. Amazing kills. Wicked. Right. Dave Z, that means that of a maximum 50 points, you gave this movie 41, which is the same score that Bo gave it and is one more than mike gave it thank you very much last but not least tyler um what you got to say about what you've heard and about this movie before we get to your scores yeah uh like he said i'm kind of just on clean up here yeah. um <laughs> if we were all in line with house uh by the cemetery we're like well, who are we all going to be in line with city of the Living dead yeah uh it, yeah, like like I was saying with House by the Cemetery, this movie has isn't really that concerned about his narrative, and it just lets gives him license to take this like foundation, like this is what's happening, and kind of do whatever he wants. And like this kind of just reminds me of like some like weird movie like you'd find in like the video store and not know what it was, and like go mm -hmm. home like watch late at night, like stoned out of your mind in the nineties, <laughs> and been like, what the fuck is this? It's just like it dessert like. <laughs> It, it kind of like reaches like that that weird like that place too where like kind of like you have like th the cinema snobs of the world like kind of meet the horror fans because there really is like a, a very interesting style stylistic um mm -hmm. uh tone to like all of Fulci's works but it's like really on display in this trilogy so yeah and I can't really disagree with much I've always been a fan of this film and this trilogy in general awesome right let's talk your scores for this one as well what did you give the story i gave the story a seven that's the same as what dave gave it and that is one below what mike and bo gave it what did you give the acting uh the acting i gave it a six yep that's only one below uh i think the average would be seven um what about the effects effects are an eight yeah, scoring high. That is in line with what Bo gave it and one below what both Dave and Mike gave it. Um, what are you giving the soundtrack? I gave the soundtrack a seven. I probably could have gone a point higher if I was thinking about it more. 
yep, that's uh, once again not far off. So you're one below what Mike and uh, Bo gave it, and two below what Dave gave it. Um, and lastly, kills. Uh, I give the kills an eight. You come in with an eight there, which is the same score that Mike gave it. Two below Bo and one below uh, Dave. Uh, which means, uh, of a total of 50 points, Tyler, you gave the movie 36. Which means if we're running from high scores to low scores, um, we have a Dave Z, Bo Ransdell, top scoring of 41 points for the movie. Uh, or one point below that in uh, the second place would be Mike Merriman with 40 points. And then at the bottom would be yourself with 36. Um, with that, we'd like to thank Bo Ransdell for his uh, participation here. And if he would like to step down from the docket, we'll get ready and jump to our next movie. So, uh, before we obviously hand over to our next uh, podcaster to defend their movie, uh, I have to give deets. So, uh, we are doing Daguerreotype from 2016. I just want to confirm Bo Ransdell, who did the research earlier on. Did I pronounce that okay? Yes, you did Thank a you. fantastic job. Perfect. My memory is for once. Daguerreotype. There we go. <laughs> yep, there you go. Daguerreotype. <laughs> That's how I'm figuring it out. <laughs> I now want that as a sounder. Um, although, <laughs> if, we're being, if we want to butcher a sexy language, its original title in French is Le Secret de la Chambre Noire. Oh, eh? You know what that means? The, the Secret of the Black Room is a truly dumb title. <laughs> does, sounds like a Jallo. <laughs> like, yep. <laughs> it really does. Uh, yeah, I mean, yeah, if you include an animal, like, you know, the Jackal Strikes in the Black Room. Oh, dude, something. that's my favorite movie. <laughs> Did you not know? <laughs> it's Umberto Lindsay. It's <laughs> like so Lindsay's Lost Jallo, um, which is the name of my experimental punk band. Um, there's a... Uh, <laughs> Uh, like we're going to end up getting into a DBCC like world, so let's not do this to everyone else here, where we just start rewriting history. Um, right, like the get a type, <laughs> directed by Kuroshi Kurosawa, who also um, I love IMDb just sets up um, instead of going into the writing and all the rest. Kuroshi Kurosawa did the scenario um, and was has a scenario consultant who is Hiromi Kurosawa, um, but this is an adaptation of uh, Catherine. Pielli and Elorona Ma, whatever your surname is, I can't pronounce that, so let's not do that. Um, so yeah, I think it's loosely based on a novel. And some Japanese men did scenario stuff on it. Uh, the DP of this one is Alexis Kavrechin. I think that's not how you pronounce it. Uh, he has done a lot of TV in France. Uh, loads of TV in France and a lot of French movies. Uh, I didn't put the names down because it would force me to use my tongue in a way which is not as accustomed. Um, the score is done by Gregory Hetzel, who's also done a ton of scores for French TV and French cinema. The cast here is Tahar Rahim, uh, Constance Rizzo, Oliver Gourmet, uh, Matteo Amarak, Malik Z <laughs> Ziddy, um, Jacques Collard, Fabrice Ad, uh, and Thomas Cummins. Um, synopsis for this one is when an assistant to the daguerreotype photographer falls in love with the latter's daughter, the relationship mirrors the art form as love and pain combine. Um, in terms of the trivia, IMDb had nothing. So I then went to Wikipedia. Wikipedia had nothing um and then i went to loosely the internet and the internet had things that couldn't be substantiated in any way shape or form so under the trivia segment i have nothing um with that in mind i'm gonna turn this over and call uh, one mr dave z to the docket here um present a movie that i'll be honest i think i it's safe to say was a first time watch for every single one of us here. So Dave, um, put your case forward or against the movie Daguerreotype. Okay, so this movie called... Uh... Daguerreotype. <laughs> yeah. um, strange. Strange to see. What do you get when you cross a, a Japanese director mm. trying to make a French film? Which, boy, I don't think I've seen that tackled before but the answer is daguerreotype that's the answer. <laughs> um, <laughs> nice, nice. And, and i must say 
boy, it's boring. Oh, boy. <laughs> I, you know, and that could be a me. Uh, that could could be a me problem because I'm known to drift off and ADHD, and sometimes things don't grasp me, and some oh. people think something's a masterpiece, but I've zoned off. I don't think in this case I'm going to get a whole lot of pushback, but I am going to tell you that it, I think it looks great mm. right off the bat. It's like, oh wow, it looks nice. The colors pop. It's well shot. You know, there's a couple you know, the movies. You know. The narrative's going slow, but we get a couple creepy shots, that, that spooky shot of that girl standing on the stairs, and then we get this guy applying for the assistance, and then we get into all this talk about, um, <laughs> wait, what, what, what is it called again? Hold on. Real estate. The type. <laughs> yeah. We get into all that talk about that, and <laughs> the history of it, and taking, you know, pictures using this method, and I was really hoping, especially from a Japanese um, director, where we've seen many things um, in Asian cinema mm. where there's a lot of discussion in horror movies about pictures and what could show up in pictures mm -hmm. and imprints and all that other stuff. And it doesn't really go into it the way I was hoping it would. I'm like, okay, if this is a horror thing, let's see what's going to happen here. What's going to go on with these, you know, these pictures and, you know, the, the making of them and how that's different from modern photography. And is this going to lead to something cool? Is there going to be a ghost trapped in something or what's going to happen here so you know i'm waiting and i'm waiting and <laughs> doesn't really happen then somebody doesn't want to he doesn't want to sell his land and there's there's fights about that the other guy gets involved a girl fakes her death and i'm just like and then i, I thought for a minute maybe this is really going to turn into straight up horror because this dude came up from underwater and i was like oh what's what's this is this going to be no not that's that's really not what's going on here um you know I'm going to bet that people aren't going to oppose me on this. I don't think it was a Dave Z problem. I just think it's a movie problem. <laughs> and Stephen King famously said a critique about um, The Shining, mm. which is my favorite horror movie, so I'm not taking it seriously. But his quote was that The Shining was a great, big, beautiful Cadillac with no motor inside. Mm -hmm. Now, I'm not going to go on to call this movie a great, big, beautiful Cadillac because of the, you know, the technical aspects or whatnot. But I would say it's kind of like a, um, you know, a really a souped up Acura Integra with uh, maybe a four cylinder motor in there. You know what I mean? That's that's all I could say. There isn't it just bored the hell out of me. And I really am curious as to how the jury's going to decide here, because I was just straight up bored, and there's nothing worse a movie can be than boring. So, th there you have it. Um, before you remove the the um, device that allowed you to pronounce the name, can we have it one more time, please, for prosperity? Yes, yes, it's, it's always ready to go. See? <laughs> Daguerreotype. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I um, before I hand, before we go to your scores and hand it over and stuff, I was super curious about this one because... Um, Karushi Kurosawa's horror efforts to me are really well known and like we were saying before we started recording the same year this movie came out it put out Creepy um, Creepy was seen by most critics as a return to form for him because he'd been off doing lots of weird stuff in between like a lot of Japanese directors will do um, in between you know projects which become like uh, synonymous with their style um, and as soon as I found out it was a cool French production, I instantly thought, well, this actually makes a lot of sense to me because these movies, very similar when you watch a, like a Park Chan Wook movie, they, they feel like they have a kind of, a, like a delicate Western influence that really works with the, the kind of Asian storytelling. So there's a marriage there. Um, I don't want to give away my scores until the very end, but Dave Z, um, I, am, I am almost... I'm almost there with you on everything. <laughs> so, ah, <yeah. laughs> but um, let's let's get your scores out so we can then start benchmarking where everyone else falls on this. Um, so let's talk first about the story for you. What did you give the story? I gave it a four. Mm. I don't think it's too harsh. I just was bored and I understand the story they were trying to tell, but it just, it's not for me. Cool. Um, acting? Acting is an eight. That's... It's one of the strong points. They they did well, yeah. Effects. Effects is a nine. It's it's very it's very well made. I'm taking everything into account, and uh, it's a really well made movie. Uh, soundtrack. Soundtrack is a four. I barely even remembered. I guess it's 
slightly below generic horror movie type soundtrack. It, e- even if it's horror movie, I don't even know if it's horror soundtrack. It's just it's just strings in the background. I don't it's know. there. <laughs> That's yeah, it's there. <laughs> and, and kills. Kills one because really, what the, what the hell happens here? Yep. Uh, so sorry, but one. <laughs> Which means out of a maximum fifty points, you gave this movie twenty six. So let's swing it round and see. I mean, but generally, if we get a, like either a super high score or a super low score, we get some margin in between. Let's find out if we get any here. We're going to start, like I said before, going in order. So we're going to go Mike first. Additional comment, anything that hasn't been mentioned before we get to your scores. Um, I'll just say traditionally I am a fan of slow burns. I, I've read a couple reviews of this that said like dark, moody, atmospheric. I don't know what the hell movie they were watching because n- <laughs> that was a maybe a professional way of saying boring. Because like those <laughs> elements that they describe, I usually appreciate in movies. I when it comes to horror, you you can give me a slow burn as long as there's something burning by the end of the movie or mm. throughout the movie. I, I think of a movie like Audition, where like there are long periods of audition where it's like literally two people staring at each other or talking, but you get little crumbs throughout the movie that remind you, oh, I'm watching a horror movie, and then you kind of get your money shot or sequence towards the end to make to make it worth it to give you the punch. This one, it just kind of drags along. I mean, we we get the crux of the story pretty soon or pretty quick. And then it just kind of goes nowhere for two hours and uh, then it ends. So I, I, I'm not going to give much pushback to uh, Dave's uh, comments on the movie. Right. Well, let's get to your scores then. What did you give the story? I gave the story a five. It's It wasn't hard to understand or follow. It's just there wasn't a lot to it. That is uh, one above what Dave gave it. What did you give acting? Acting, I gave a seven because, you know, looking at the movie, I thought the actors did a fine job with what they had. I can't really hold it against them for the script or the story. That is one below what Dave gave it. Um, effects? Uh, I gave the effects a three because <laughs> the, 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 cam- the camera was on, so we saw stuff. But other than that, no. So that's, that, that's a massive six below what Dave gave it. Um, <laughs> soundtrack? I gave it a two because I honestly can't even remember much of a mm. soundtrack at all. So that's two below what Dave gave it. And lastly, kills. I mean, other than my attention span, it didn't really kill much <laughs> in this movie. So <laughs> I, I gave it a two, and even I think that might be charitable for the kills. <laughs> <laughs> and that's a one above what Dave gave it, um, which means that of a maximum of 50 points that could have been given to this movie you gave this movie 19 uh thank you very much mike uh bold and um anything that has been said hasn't been said i'm looking at your score there may be comments here from you um even if it is just to risk yeah. points so what do you think i so my my like in appreciation of the film is much lower than my score yeah um <laughs> because uh, here's the thing <laughs> here's Here's the thing that happens when you're scoring based on these kinds of categories. Yep. It's like, all right, well, I, I stand by my scores, except for one, and I'll get to that in a second. But I, I like I stand by the individual scores, but this is one of those cases where the sum of the parts is much less than the parts. Yeah, this um, is what, like I, the reason I opted for this one is, and I use this analogy on almost all the recordings, is if you ask me on the teapots out of five scale, what I give pieces, I give it a five, um, mm-hmm. because I could watch any time that movie's on. I am like overjoyed and can't wait to watch it. You, you asked me to break it down to story, acting, effects, soundtrack, and kills. It's nowhere near fifty points. <laughs> you know what I mean, it's struggling in some of those to get over three points. Um, so uh, yeah, it's, it, it, may, it forces you to be a little bit more critical, Borans. Though it it does indeed, mm. and I I find. Uh, that I agree with everything that's been said about it just being boring as sin. Um, and yeah, but but it's competently made. Like, the, you know, and that's the thing that I, I think most people are, are saying is that on a technical level, Daguerreotype works pretty well. 
Um, it's just when it comes to, you know, entertaining and engaging an audience that things mm -hmm. really go off the rails. And it also helped solidify for me a thing that I think I realize uh, about me as a movie viewer, which is that I hate a movie that gives you a little sleight of hand. But in this case, the the twist ending is something that you can see coming a mile away. <laughs> You know, like there's a point where basically uh, Stefan, the uh, photographer, says like, hey, uh, well, you've been living with Marie, my daughter. That's bullshit. She's dead. <laughs> and then there's another hour of the movie where he's like, no, 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 she's fine. And you're like, no, she went through her fucking window, brother. Like, you don't walk away from that. Anyway, uh, so I hate that. Um, and, 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 but the, the thing that's most frustrating is that you do get these glimpses of, of Kurosawa's like genius mm. with filmmaking and his understated kind of dread, uh, approach to cinema. I don't think it works well when combined with this sort of romantic Gothic story that he's trying to tell. I, I, I think there's a, a dissonance right there i don't i don't think that kurosawa lends himself to that kind of baroque and one of the reasons i kind of like the music is it is like orchestral and baroque and all of that stuff um but it doesn't really fit i think what kurosawa wants to do and i also really really love the idea of like taking a picture and it, it keeping part of you like the 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 essential part of the story about the daguerreotype is really interesting mm -hmm. And all of that gets buried under real estate dealings. <laughs> and it it pisses me off so much that this movie is over two hours long. And there's a solid, like, you know, almost smile style <laughs> hour, 40 minute movie in here. And it just, it drives me crazy. Like there's a good movie to be made about this photographer and and also duncan god damn it um <laughs> at the beginning of the movie the the camera starts off looking at the wires of mm -hmm. the subway and i'm like hey, i'm onto you kurosawa i've seen your work before <laughs> this is all about technology and how we put technology above the movie mm -hmm. or above the people in this movie and then we're dealing with a photographer who only deals with human beings in terms of their images that he's capturing with this old technology and i'm like hey, i got you kurosawa and then it just becomes a a dumbass like is she dead or isn't she thing <laughs> and it pisses me off that this is almost a really good like dr like i said dread inducing kind of horror film and it just pisses it away that's kind of there's there's a part of me that feels like what you're basically saying is this is kurosawa's um the phantom menace <laughs> But it's like you know what the you know, yeah. what, you know what our audience needs trade negotiations it, uh, right <laughs> You know what's scary? Someone forging your signature. <laughs> what the fuck? Anyway, yes. I anyway, my, my scores are going to be higher. I feel like I need to say at the outset, I think this is a dreadfully dull film, mm -hmm. and it's a, a tremendous waste of a lot of talent involved. Well, let's get to those scores then. What did you give Story? A 10, Duncan. No. Um, <laughs> I, gave, <laughs> I gave it a 6. Uh, because there is a good story buried in here, but I think it's wasted. Uh, right, so that is two above Dave, one above Mike. Uh, what did you give the acting? So I gave the acting an eight because mm. they sounded French and they sounded like they knew what they were talking about. <laughs> but then I was doing some research on the movie also, Duncan. Oh. And one of the things I read was like, oh, yeah, the performances are like way overblown. And I'm like, <laughs> well, I don't know because I don't speak French. So I gave it an eight, but that may be bullshit. <laughs> if that's bullshit it's in it's in line with what dave gave it and what mike gave it so uh, you're one above mike but exactly what dave gave it and um, the effects uh i gave it a five there aren't a ton the daguerreotype stuff is kind of fun but then everything else is is real dumb right, that's four below dave and that is two above mike and um, what about the sim track uh, I gave it a six. Uh, like I said, I think I think there's something about the orchestral score I like on its own. I don't know that it fits well with this movie, but I also don't think anything fits real well in this movie. Right, so that's two above Dave and four above Mike. And then lastly, Kills. Kills, all right. I, I gave this a six because there, uh, the girl falling down the steps and landing in a puddle... Mm. Um, gave, it gave me a flashback to Maxine when Kevin Bacon 
does the header off of the loading yeah. dock. <laughs> and I gave it good a good score because it reminded me of a thing that I really like. <laughs> <laughs> Right, um, so that is uh, five above what Dave gave it, and four yeah. of. It's <laughs> a great memory. Uh, and four That's above. Need and it, it, and the punchline of it's even better. Anyway, <laughs> uh, four above what um Mike gave it, which means out of a maximum of fifty points, you gave this movie thirty one, uh, which would put you five above what Dave gave it, and. <laughs> 12 above what Mike gave it. Um, thank you very much, Bo. Uh, let's finally go once again to Tyler. Sorry, Tyler. You get to lead on the next review, so you'll be you'll be front and centre, and then everyone else can talk. Um, but, yeah, I, I'm looking at your scores here. I'm wondering, like, Bo, is there something that we're missing out here? Well, <laughs> um... I don't think <laughs> I'm going to necessarily disagree with where this film is. Sitting it. Oh, hold on a second. Did I hit something weird? I'm hearing weird noise. Okay, there we go. I was hearing weird feedback. But anyways, yeah. Um, so I don't necessarily think I'm disagreeing where this film is going to land in any sort of placement. But um, I make the case that I don't think this is actually a bad movie. Um, I I actually didn't find this movie boring. Mm. Um, I think the issue with the movie is that there it, it is too long. And it's not that I, that it's boring, but there's stuff in it, but it seems like it spends some time, uh, like, doing things that don't actually move the plot forward, so it makes it bloated, and you're just gonna, and, like, if you're already not liking it, you're gonna get frustrated with it. So, like, I, I do think that, like, the runtime itself is an issue. Um, I'm, I'm a big fan uh, of Kurosawa, not just for his horror films, and the biggest issue with this movie to me is it didn't, it, it didn't feel like a Kurosawa movie. He's using a French crew. And the thing about him, like you can see a lot more like him creepy, for instance, is he's very smooth with his camera. And mm -hmm. it's like, and he's very good with uh, creating like this, like this, this like sound design that's just like very in tune with the movie. And that's what like, and that's what works with his pacing. Like it, he's almost like trying to do that same thing but not in the style that he's come that he's usually doing and it's i think what makes the movie like feel a lot more dry and a lot more uh kind of kind of just uh like unfocused uh so that's really the bigger issue with it but like i didn't really like find it boring or anything i wasn't like begging for it to end um i don't think the story is that bad but i do think it's just the execution isn't the greatest and they're like I, I'm not arguing this is a great movie or anything, but I don't like I this is I wouldn't consider this a bad movie, and I don't think it's that uncompetitive with the other movies um, in, in this in this grouping. Cool. Well, let's see if your scores align with your views. And um, what did you give the story? The story I gave a seven. Right, so that's the highest we've had thus far: one above Bo, two above Mike, and three above Dave. What did you give the acting? I gave the acting a seven. Which is the same as Mike, one below what Dave and Bo gave it. What did you give the effects? The effects I kind of had to apply to like, what's the, what are, what are we putting effort into this mm -hmm. movie? And so I guess it would be the cinematography and the average course our movie, I think would be much higher, but this was still decent. This is, you know, still professionally made movie. So I give that a six. Yep. That's the second highest score overall for it. So you are three below Dave, one above Bo and uh, three above Mike. Uh, what did you give the soundtrack? Uh, the soundtrack, um, it's it's kind of tough to value because obviously there's not much, but uh, part of part of putting a product for it is you know determining what is best for this movie. And I thought what was used was good for the movie, but it's nothing that like is a standout or anything. I think, but I think it's good for the movie, so I gave it a six. Yep, that's the same as what Bo gave it. It's two above what Dave gave it, and four above what Mike gave it. Lastly, kills. Yeah, uh, and then I get for kills. It's kind of hard to evaluate since it's not really that type of movie. But the instances that did involve that, I thought it had a reasonable impact. But obviously, it could have been things that would have that could have been done better. So I put the right in the middle at five. You gave it a five. That is one below Bo. That is four above Dave, and that is three above Mike. Which means, out of a total of fifty points, you gave this movie thirty-one. 
which means that yourself and Bo uh, scored at the highest with 31 points, and then Dave uh, came in under you with 26, and Mike came in with low score in this movie at 19. Um, thank you very much, Tyler. Don't go anywhere, Tyler, because we're about to call you up, but we will thank Dave Z for his participation. And um, yeah, let's, uh, let's move to our final movie of this episode, and why not let's just stay in France? Um, the final movie that we're discussing on this episode is High Tension. This is the kind of feature debut of Alexander Azure. Um, wildly credited, even though I would argue possibly not because of its placement in the year it came out as one of the, the, the kind of forefathers of the new wave of French extremity. But it did come out in 2003. Um, Azure co-wrote it with his friend, um, a long-time collaborator, Gregory Lavasseur. Uh, the DP on this one is Francois Emudes Chanfrout, um, who has done a ton of stuff directly with Azure, but also done some stuff out with that. So this is his guy's creds, just some of them. So he did the Hills Have Eyes remake, so we've mentioned it before, he did P2, he did the Crazies remake, he did the Maniac remake, he did Annabelle Creation, and weirdly Shazam, because um, why not? Um, and yeah, the score here done by a name that I can very difficultly pronounce, so let's skip that. But the, the, the guy that did the score did Inside and Donkey Punch, um, as well as other movies, which uh, are mostly French. Cast here, <laughs> why you'll be doing this to me, Cecile de France, Malwain, Philippe Nahon, Frank Kauf, uh, Cafun, uh, Andre Finti, Anna Piella, uh, Marco Claudio Pascu, Jean-Claude de Grosso, um, Bogdan, you've got a hard surname to pronounce, and we won't do any more names now. Um, the synopsis for this one is best friends Marie and Alexia decide to spend a quiet weekend at Alexia's parents' secluded farmhouse. But on the night of their arrival, the girl's idyllic getaway turns into an endless night of horror. Uh, there was tons, tons, tons and tons and tons of trivia for this one compared to the previous movie. But here are a couple of ones that I picked that I found quite interesting. So like I mentioned before, Aja and Lavasseur are childhood friends and made this film as an homage to the old school horror films of the 70s and 80s that the two would watch growing up. Which I kind of like that bit of trivia. Um, and then this one just for, for shits and giggles. The camera used during the car attack scene got so much flake blood on it during the shooting that when it was being used on another film later, the, the fake blood oozed out of it when they were trying to focus on a shot. <laughs> Literally drenched in blood. Um, the podcast under the stairs at this point would like to call either for or against in his review um mr tyler to make his way to the docket and tyler if you wouldn't mind regaling us with your views on high tension aka hot tension or if you're in the uk the most emo name for a, a movie ever switchblade romance because that's what they called it over here um the floor is yours all right i'm really glad i got this one because i think this one makes for the most interesting conversation 100 percent so this is a movie I've seen a lot of times over over the years, and around when I was really kind of getting into like that, you know, like level two horror, like mm -hmm. when you first start hitting that iceberg, this was like a really big. This movie was a really big deal at the time. And you can really see how influential this film has been. Um, but I would say this film is about as a mixed bag as you could get. <laughs> uh, there's some things that this movie does like extremely well that like I like I watched today and I'm even like wow like that that's badass. Um, but there's also some stuff in this movie that's really not good. Um, to address the elephant in the room, uh, <laughs> so I find that this movie's very divisive, uh, give it because of its twist and. I've always argued I'm okay with the twist. I think the movie act like by the logic of the movie, it covers itself and what it's trying to do. However, I'm also not going to pretend it's good. And I think it's a cop out at best just because uh. you can make it make sense. I don't think it's good. I think it's pretty lazy writing. And I think uh, I, I definitely can't fault anyone for taking, um, uh, taking umbrage with that. <laughs> But uh, 
the the first act of this movie, like the home invasion, that, that's some of like the greatest stuff from this era. This movie's so realistically violent and like so mean spirit in that act that this is like this will have a place in horror history uh, forever. It just it's so it's so vicious, like with the with the family, and it gets it's really tense and it's really exciting. And even like the little cat and mouse chase, I don't think it's as good as like that opening home invasion act, but it's still exciting. It gets you really invested. And like these are these elements, like in particular, I think are, are really good. Um, I, I think a lot of the side characters, like the parents and even like the gas station clerk, like they're all fine, but I also think the two lead actors are not very really good in this movie. Uh, it's even worse if you listen to the dub. I switched it to the French version because the <laughs> dub was driving me insane. <laughs> but yeah, I, it's a movie I've been a lot. I, I was a lot higher on in my past, um, and I still really do like this movie for its flaws. I can just like I, I see the issues with it, but it it does bring a lot to the table that does set it apart from a lot of movies even like now. And it was su it was super influential and kind of like amping up that violence along with these other french films or these other european films i like to just call them like to move horror up like a dial or like we, we move the bar of what like is acceptably violent up because of this movement of films and this because of that i think like this is something that's all that always should be like canon for horror viewing very nice right well let's uh let's drill into those scores uh, high on some stuff not high on other stuff let's find out the bears out here what are you giving the story so like i said with the story like even though like i can understand the argument that it technically makes sense i think it's still just not good writing and it's kind of lazy and it's it could just be done a lot better and get the same results so i gave that a four you gave it a four what did you give the acting the acting like i said i don't think the two leads are very good i gave them a four also what did you give the effects the effects fucking rule and they're so mean-spirited and realistic <laughs> like that scene within the closet oh my god i give the effects a nine you give it a nine soundtrack what are you giving it soundtrack i like the the music cues it does use when it use my like the little sing-along at the beginning it's like kind of like really tongue-in-cheek and like it's a good contrast to the rest of the movie so i give that a seven and lastly what did you give kills and the kills are also great i give those an eight which means tyler uh, of a total of 50 points you give high tension 32 thank you very much don't go anywhere because we're going to open up the floor um we are going to go to mike first mike anything that uh, you disagree with anything you want to double down on uh, anything you want to pat uh, tyler's back um, and say good job um before we get to your scores um i don't have a whole lot to add just more reiterate the fact that i think scores on this movie i think there's certain elements of this movie that are you can't really argue with but there but when it comes to like the story elements i can i can see the grades fluctuating highly mm. just depending on how much you're willing to uh buy into the the logic of a, like an unreliable narrator or it's coming from the brain and head of someone who's like delusional and batshit insane um and sometimes that that element is improved or worsened with multiple watches, depending on the person. So I, I will say this is the first time I've watched this in a while. So like I knew, I, I mean, I remembered everything going into it for the most part, but sometimes when you've had some space between watches and you go back to it, you your uh, outlook or whatever changes mm. on it. So we'll see. Right, let's talk story. What did you give the score for story? All right, so with everything I just said, yeah, I am a bit of an apologist. Uh, I, I think through like 75% of the movie, it feels like a pretty straightforward uh, story until that big twist swerve comes and you're first you're trying to make sense of it. And then by the end, you're like, okay, I think I kind of understand what's going on. But I guess with my score of a seven, you could say I'm a, an, an apologist for how it all comes together. Right, so you give it a seven. That is three above what Tyler gave it. What did you give the acting? Uh, acting, also a seven. I guess I'm a little more friendly to uh, the two leads than Tyler was. <laughs> <laughs> right, that's a three above what Tyler gave it. Um, effects? Effects, to me, I mean, that'd be one of the categories that I don't see much to argue about here. Everything looks good, vicious uh graphic 
uh, everything you would kind of want in this type of movie. So I went with a nine. Yep, that's bang on what Tyler gave it. Um, soundtrack? Soundtrack I enjoyed. Uh, I like like kind of like the French poppy upbeat uh, music at times. Uh, gives it a real local flavor to it, especially this era because this is kind of when I was in my early 20s and I was really starting to learn more about French uh, horror films uh, to begin with. So like hearing the kind of like the local music, uh, I gave it, what did I give it? A uh, seven. Yeah, you gave a seven, which is spot on what Tyler gave it. And then lastly, Kills. Kills, I gave a nine. I mean, I, I thought even even the more like low key ones, like we get a throat slash, but it's done really well. It's really graphic. It looks gross. And then you have just like the more over the top kills. I just think pretty much every kill in this was well done and it's hard to argue that for for me that they would go any lower than what i gave which is a nine very nice which means out of a total of 50 points you gave high tension 39 um that would be seven points above what tyler gave the movie uh, thank you very much mike over to bo ransdell famously famously has already called on a previous recording uh he took shots at this movie before we even reached it um like so i've been i've been curious to see where you land although we've spoken about this movie so i know exactly what your opinions are um no, no, nothing has surprised me but maybe to listeners that haven't heard them uh anything that you want to kind of double down on uh pick apart uh, what say you duncan do you remember uh at the end of every episode of scooby-doo <laughs> when they would solve the mystery using a clue they had never given you as the audience <laughs> that's kind of how i feel about high tension so you Where left I'm... it as a charming reminder of your childhood yeah more more that it feels like it it cheats a little bit and you know like like tyler said this very well and i, I don't want to mind too much of that same uh field but um I do think there is there are certain movies that can get away with the like, ah, oh, it was her all the time kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, like, I think Fight Club gets away with that well enough. Uh, Usual Suspects gets away with that. I don't think High Tension gets away with that. And as such, it's hard for me to, re to re-watch this movie because it's not just like, oh, it's an unreliable narrator. It does feel like a cheat. And so watching it, as much as I admire a lot of the filmmaking around this movie, uh, I don't like watching it beyond the technical uh, appreciation of it because the whole time I'm like, eh, that's bullshit, eh, that's bullshit, you know? And it it, it drains it of fun for me. Uh, and I know I'm a real stick in the mud about this movie. <laughs> I have been since the first time I saw it. The first time I saw it, I was like, Oh, go fuck myself, uh, I think is how I felt about it. And I still kind of feel that way. Um, but it, like, I do appreciate another example of like the scores are pretty good for this movie because mm -hmm. there's a lot to like about it. I just don't enjoy watching it because I feel at the end of the day, it's kind of a cheat that it doesn't, even though Tyler said that it, it sort of explains itself. I don't know that I get there. I, I don't think that it it lives up to the logic that it's set for us um especially towards the end when you're getting to the like well then how did you get locked in there if you're doing the locking oh it's all in your head okay whatever then that means <laughs> that there's just no there's no rules and you gotta have something i, I but, mean there is there is a movie that i would i would say from an american point of view um does this exact same thing where at the end of the movie even the the, the narrator says this confession is meaningless which would be american cycle in which you watch an entire yeah, movie, which is a delusion of, delusion of a central character that maybe kills no one. Yeah, yeah. And, and like, I'm not crazy about Americans. Like <laughs> again, How dare no, you flip-flop in here, Bo, Bo Ransdell. The flip-flopper strikes again. <laughs> I, like, I go back and forth on American Psycho. Know, like, it do, it depends know. on the day you catch me, but uh, right now I'm like, yeah, you're right. That, fuck that movie. <laughs> I, love, I love that. I could just, I'm just going to mention a strip of them now. You're just going to be tearing about your collection. Um, yeah. so, uh, right. Uh, anyway, anyway. Like, it, like you, so what you're saying is, from a technical point of view, your grades are probably going to score pretty high, but from a bow sitting down, and I've got some time, I'm just going to throw a movie on, unlikely to be high tension. Very unlikely, yeah. 
Right, cool. Let's talk your scores then. Um, okay, right. What did you give the story? Uh, I gave it a six for um, effectively being Dean Koontz's intensity. Right. Um, so that is two above what Tyler gave it and one below what Mike gave it. Uh, acting. Uh, an eight. I think they're they're pretty convincing. Like when they go for the emotional stuff, I think that works. Right, that's four above what Tyler gave it and one above what Mike gave it. Uh, effects? Uh, also an eight. I, I some really good grisly stuff in here. Yep, that's... Um... You know, in particular, uh, the head that he throws out the window, <laughs> the guy that doesn't exist, you know? Um, <laughs> but doesn't the... exist either, Bo, but that's fine. Yeah, right. Well, that... Oh, God damn it. Anyway. <laughs> um, but... But the, the the head that he tosses out the window, a great head. Yeah. Uh, it really good. I, I I was really impressed by watching it. I'm also sure that the driver who's imaginary in that van also said the same thing. Great head. Um, so <laughs> if you know, you know. <laughs> but, but, <laughs> but you know if if an imaginary person uh, makes a a sex pun in an imaginary van, does anyone hear it, Duncan? <laughs> the old philosopher's question it is indeed it is indeed uh, uh, aristotle i believe um <laughs> so <laughs> aristotle <laughs> we're doing a dbcc thing again we're moving off to the side um M mike is making some valid points in the chat here that i don't want to get derailed by too much but he, he he's asking um in fact mike you, you can unmute yourself and and say it aloud and it is a point that i'd never thought about before and i'm keen to now go back and check Oh yeah, I didn't want to derail by trying to get like too uh, into the weeds on us on one of the movies, but watching it this time and and looking, I it looks like the head that he throws out the truck is the head of the main dark haired chick. So it, it makes is, me, yeah. So it makes me think that like, it, and it's hard. It's something hard to pick up, especially on a first watch, because you're not gonna maybe re even think about the actual face on that head, uh, other than it's like. <laughs> I, I, I had never picked up before, but now oh, it, dude. it makes, it makes me, me I think like that. even more now. You just stole all my thunder. I had this yeah. thing about the head, and I never noticed it until actually my wife noticed it because she's famous for noticing things I don't. And it that scene changed my entire view of this movie because it was able I was able to piece everything together finally. But yeah, I I, sense of and like, the comparison to American Psycho too. I think this might just be my opinion, but I think American Psycho at least does a better job it's, it's of throwing us ambiguous. breadcrumbs. Yeah, it's, it's, yeah, it I also think, yeah. I also yeah. think there, there's a part of the end of American Psycho, not to get lost in the weeds here, uh, but there's a part of American Psycho where it's deliberately left ambiguous. So it could have happened and the people are just overlooking it to sell a high-rented property, or he is actually insane. And the, the movie nor the book actually go out their way to put a final stamp on that they leave it kind of out there and then if you watch american cycle too why you would watch that i don't know uh, they all but say he did it all so there you are um, <laughs> like, um but yeah right. uh, that's an interesting point and i love to hear dave's views on it as well but that is oh. that's something kind of cool to uh, bring in there because i had never clocked that and like i say it's, it's making me love it even more um bo i can't even remember where we were with you i think kill uh, it's soundtrack soundtrack, soundtrack. Yeah, yeah, yeah yes what did you give soundtrack? Uh, soundtrack is a seven. Got the, you know, it, it's got that late nineties, early two thousands kind of grungy electronic nastiness. I like <laughs> the grungy electronic. That's what, they, that's what I think about you when I think about you, Bo. Uh, what mm -hmm. is he listening to today? Grungy electronic nastiness. Mm -hmm. um, while doing the lawn. Uh, that is like you are in line with all the scores thus far that we've had. Uh, lastly, kills. Yeah, also in eight, there's some some really good like grizzly effects work, and the kills are brutal and and you know I mean it, like we talked about it's that French new wave right where it's yeah. like you know we are going to be gross. <laughs> they said, "You're you're you're losing me, French listeners." Um, what are you doing? Here? Uh, <laughs> right. um, okay, which means Bo out of a, a, a grand total of fifty, you scored this movie surprisingly high. You give it thirty seven out of fifty. Mm overall yeah. <laughs> don't sound unhappy about that I, I will... <laughs> how dare you um right let's uh, go to final voice on this one final voice in the final movie uh dave z yeah i love this movie i've always been a fan of it it was always number two to martyrs for me as far as the french extreme go 
And um, this is probably the fifth time I've seen it total. And for me, it's a major thing for me that I need things to make sense. I have problems enjoying it when it doesn't make sense. And a lot of times I'll find myself piecing things together and seeing what can be plausible, what could be possible, and what's going to, you know, how can I piece things together that are confusing me? And initially when I saw this movie, I was turned off with the reveal. Now as time's gone on, I've, I've had heard other discussions, I've talked to people, I've heard a few different things. I, I, I realize that this is the unreliable narrator, it's definitely her telling the story, so therefore we're getting it from her. My only problem before was the head and the head and the guy in the truck, because I'm like, well, why would that be? But now <laughs> I'm watching it with my wife and I think she may have seen it once before, not mm. positive, but she always does. I, I keep telling her, man, please, please watch every movie that I'm going to do on podcast. <laughs> with me. Cause she always gives me these great things to bring up on things I've never noticed. And she brought up the fact when that head hit the ground, she goes, Hey, isn't that the head from the girl? From the other, I'm like, oh my gosh! I go, I've, that was always what I had the biggest problem with. Now let me re reassess this. Mm -hmm. So now I'm watching the movie. Not only they, she has this obsession with his head for the whole movie, mm -hmm. and we see that part there, yes. But when they're driving up to uh, to go to this girl's parents' place, and she's busting her balls about something, she tells the girl, she goes, oh yeah, she goes, great, she goes, laugh your head off, she said, mm -hmm. right in that same area where things are going to go down later. She says, laugh your head off. Then we see the head. And then later on in the climax, when the killer's coming at her, I don't know if he was when he had the saw or not, which by the way, that circular saw is incredible. <laughs> um, he, he is speaking about severing her head. So this killer has a fascination about this girl's head coming off. Mm -hmm. And that actually helped me a lot. So I'm like, okay, now movies like Fight Club, and American Psycho. They're both 10 out of 10s for me. There are still, there's instances in both movies, really one instance in, in, in Fight Club for sure, where I can't make sense. So I'm like, okay, wait a minute. If this is this, how is, but that's only one part. So I really look at these things upon rewatch with a, with a, you know, a, like an investigative eye because mm -hmm. I want to piece it together. Because if I enjoy it, I want to make sure that it's justified. So, Watching it this time, I was able to piece more and more things together, and it, it really made a big difference. And um, just overall, it's I, I enjoy it now more than I've ever enjoyed it because I finally am at a place where I believe I figured it out. I'm like, okay, that explains it. So it, it was always a movie where in the past I really enjoyed, but then I wasn't so sure about the way things ended up. But now I'm to the point where like, oh, I'm fully accepting everything for what it is. And now I believe uh, everything was done with intent and it just took me enough time to figure it out. So, so I love the movie, man. I really do. Very nice. Well, let's get into your story, uh, your scores. Then. And what did you give the story? I give the story a nine. I think it's, it's clever as hell. Uh, you know, like I said, because I believe I've quote unquote figured it out. You know what I mean? So I think that the story is actually kind of brilliant when, you know, it, mm -hmm. it's where, when I figured it out, I'm like, wow, that's really cool. So I really appreciate it. So it was a nine. Yep. That is five above what Tyler gave it. It's three above what Bo gave it, two above what Mike gave it. Um, acting. Acting, I give an eight. It's all, it's all pretty solid. Sometimes it's difficult with, um, with foreign films. Uh, for, for me, but I, as far as I saw, I thought it was uh, very solid. Yep, that's the same score that Bo gave it. One above what Mike gave it, four above what Tyler gave it. Um, effects? <laughs> nine and a half. Not quite a ten, <laughs> but nine and a half. Uh, fantastic. Fantastic all around. Uh, the gore effects, everything else, the technical aspects, the, the look of everything. Uh, to me, it's um, it just keeps getting better every time I watch it, so yeah. Yep. I mean, it's almost consistent across the board with scores here. Um, it's a 0.5 above what Tyler gave it and what Mike gave it. Um, one and a half points above what Bo gave it. Uh, soundtrack? The soundtrack, I also love. It's um, 
the soundtrack proper for the pop songs and everything else. It, it's very good. It's great for the time and everything else. It's, it's huge, right? And the score, once things start going, especially during the chase scenes, uh, I think is is pretty great. So yeah, eight and a half. Yep, that's one point five above what Tyler gave it. One point five above what Bo gave it. One point five above what Mike gave it. And um, lastly, kills. Kills are fantastic. Uh, I give it a nine. I legit the first kill of the father with the stairs and all that mm -hmm. is probably one of my favorite kills in, in all of horror. I love that. I love the um. There's a, there's a real good axe kill later on with the gas station and just in general every everything we see the the, the throat slit and I love a good throat slitting, um, <laughs> it's it's fantastic and just for bonus points this movie now a guy like me I don't care about this stuff but I know a lot of people do uh, I I personally love to see um, innocents killed mm -hmm. AKA kids and bets um, I know some people have a problem with it but they do kill a kid and a dog in this movie, but they do it in the most classy, non-exploitative -ex way yeah. that I think um, people should appreciate that because a lot of times, you know, movies get critiqued for that. So all around, excellent kills. Yep, you gave it a nine. That's the same as Mike. It's one above what both uh, Bo and Tyler gave it, which means out of a total of 50 points, Dave, you gave it 44, uh, which is also the highest score um, from any of the four hosts here for the movie followed by Mike on 39, then Bo on 37, and at the bottom score from Tyler himself at 32. Uh, Podcast Under Stairs would like to thank Tyler for his review. Uh, right, let's get into the nitty gritty as we bring this call to an end. Um, overall, I can tell you right now that House by the Cemetery got 138 points collectively from the hosts. Um, City of the Living Dead got 158 points. Uh, Daguerreotype got 107 points and High Tension got 152. So scoring from first place to last place, uh, City of the Living Dead scored the most collectively amongst the hosts with 158 points out of 200. Uh, High Tension 152 out of 200 coming in at second place. Third place, House by the Cemetery with 138 out of 200. And last but not least, Daguerreotype with 107 out of 200. Um, <coughs> As always, I like to bring in my stuff right at the end, some final thoughts from my scores, and then bring them in and show you they weren't actually required to break any ties here, but they did set up an interesting dynamic at the end. Um, so House by the Cemetery, for me, I gave it a total of 36 points um, overall, which puts me um, second highest beside Mike on this one. Uh, I've seen this movie a lot. I, I forgive it some of its... Uh, trespasses so to speak and um, it does have some issues but that gates of hell trilogy for me is when i first got introduced to Fulci, and it will always stick with me it's a bit of nostalgic blinding in there for sure uh, city of the living dead i gave it 41 points um because to me it is the better movie um i i would give the beyond probably 42 i would just pip it um more than it but yeah i i am um, i think it's kind of great across the board there um with my 41 points i would actually be joining dave and Bo on their scores um, for that. So kind of all three of us sitting with the, the top marks for that. The ghetto type, I gave 28, um, which actually puts me once again kind of in the middle of that one. It's the second highest scoring overall for that movie. I enjoyed most of it. I did find it was far too long, though. Uh, I could see the elements that stood out to me as being Kur Kurosawa's best, but I think it gets bogged down in needless plot and kind of loses a little sense of its identity in the middle. Um, and last but not least, um, on high tension, um, I... Uh, I love high tension. I, I, I really, really, really do. Um, I can argue uh, my case for, for narrative points that some people can't go with uh, by citing loads of other movies that use the same technique. And yeah, maybe this one doesn't... Um, maybe doesn't tie everything up as neatly as possible. But I think when you when you get that reveal of how deranged the character is, you kind of have to roll with it. Um, 
and if you roll with it as an audience member you will enjoy it and if you can't roll with it then it will just be like acid on the brain just irritating um so yeah i give this 47 so like i give it the most um of anyone uh the the only things i actually marked down in this um story i i gave it a nine acting i gave it a nine and soundtrack i gave it a nine everything else effects and kills are tens for me uh, when you add my scores into the scores, that's when everything changes. Um, you actually have a joint first and second place now, with 199 points at 250. Joint first place is City of the Living Dead in High Tension. Um, then followed by House by the Cemetery at 174, and to get a type at the bottom with 135 at 250. So had I been called into this one, it would have made uh, it would have made things even more confusing. So I'm kind of glad that I didn't, because we have a clear leader at the end. All that's left for me to say is thank you very much to my guest hosts for joining me on this episode. They have uh, shown up, doing, done their due diligence. There really isn't a huge sway of the scores here in or around, um, you could argue, maybe the most um, diverse of opinions and scores was the Gera type, but even then, everyone was rimmed about the same feelings overall in the movie. It was more on the technical aspects where people seemed to differ slightly. Um, and yeah, no, nothing huge here at all. We're actually surprisingly all in our in the same point cluster, which is always great to hear. We've another two of these episodes to drop in this season. Some of these hosts will be back, some of them will not. Um, and of course, we'll be running these uh, moving forward, so these voices may be back again. Uh, please check out the podcast for Bo Ransdell, uh, Tyler Tadeo, uh, for Big Dave Z and Mike Merriman, and go and support their work. They're awesome podcasters, and uh, yeah, if you like their voice, agree with their opinions here, you, there are hours, countless hours, uh, weeks, months of entertainment online for you to go and align more with their views. Um, lastly, thank you very much for checking out this episode. If you're checking it out on YouTube, like, subscribe, ding the bell to make sure you get notifications as they come in. Let me know what you made. Uh, do you agree, disagree with these scores? If you're checking us out on any of the podcatchers out there, also make sure you're subscribed. Last but not least, thank you very much for checking out this episode. Wherever you are, whatever the time zone is, and whatever you're up to in this big bad world of ours, please take care of yourselves out there. This is Duncan McLeish broadcasting live from under the stairs, and I am signing off. <laughs>